Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We come to you uh, um, with, with things of thanks uh, to you for, for your grace, for your mercy, for the forgiveness of sins, your love, for putting us together and with the family of God and as your children. But we also come, Lord, with concerns. Can, um, our hearts are moved by the suffering of others and the challenges that others are going through. And we, even as we're learning this new Bible verse from, from your word about, we look not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. We rejoice with those that rejoice. We mourn with those that mourn. And, and we, we, we know that this, is, this expansion in our hearts happens because of you living in it. Uh, and uh, now we are concerned about uh, what's happening in other people's lives. And so we pray, Lord, for, for Fanny and Brian with the cancer they have, others, and we think of Ralph and Elizabeth and Zach and Gabby and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and others that are going through, Debbie with her health and even Barb and some challenges that she's facing and Diana, Diane and Lord, we just commit them to you, and uh, sometimes we, uh, we feel helpless. We, we, there's nothing that we can do, and all we can do is surrender ourselves and the other into your loving hands and ask for strength and ask for wisdom. And so we pray for your provision, Lord. We think of others that are uh, looking for work. Uh, we pray for provision for them. Uh, for those that are in, have work and having challenges, we, we also pray for help. There's not a day that goes by, Lord, when we don't need your help and strength. And we are encouraged that your word, your word leaves us with many promises. And one of them is that if we lack wisdom, that we're to ask you in faith and that you'll give it to us. And so we pray for that. Uh, Lord, we also we think of the opportunities we have to serve this week, whether it's handing out food at 41 May Bell or the community meal that we'll be having together to, on Wednesday. And we are mindful, Lord, that all of our efforts, um, it's, it's, uh, it is for you. And so we pray that you would find our hearts set upon you. And when we sometimes struggle with our attitudes, that we'd always come back to the fact that it is your call in our life and how we are trying to uh, put you first in everything. We thank you for your goodness to us, Lord, and we thank you for bringing us together today that we might encourage and support each other in our walk with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to be starting a brand new book today, the book of uh, the Song of Solomon. And for two weeks, this Sunday and next, we're going to look at chapters one to four this morning. And then next week, we'll look at the second half of, of Song of Solomon, chapters five to eight. There's a few things just to know. No, actually, before we go, thanks, Rob. Um, I get, I get, no, no, I got a whole bunch to say, and then we'll get, uh, not a whole bunch, but uh, five minutes of introduction, because whenever we jump into a new book, oh, sorry, kids, yes, kids are dismissed uh, Sunday school. Uh, they, I'm always so thrilled when I see our kids here um, at church, and um, we've got a great Sunday school program for them today. But uh, when we think about the book Song of Solomon, it is a book about love. It's a book about romance. It's a book that includes some suggestion about the sexual relationship between the husband and the wife in the passage. Uh, you know, one of the things, uh, it, it, it's, it uh, used to be the kind of book where you're like, ooh, I can't even believe that's in the Bible. Um, but it is in the Bible because sex and marriage is God's invention. And so we ask, how does it fit? We, it fits because God is the creator of, the, of such. Uh, the other thing I realized, you know, one of the neat things about uh, going through life is what you read, when you and I re read and reread the Bible, our, we learn something new every single time. You know, I remember reading this book as a teenager and like, whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> and, and now as an adult, I read it in a different way and I, there's things I learned then and there's different things I learn now. That's the beauty of reading God's Word. Um, and there's this growing maturity that we have along the way as we try to figure out how to live life before God and, li and live it in a holy fashion. Um, my own opinion is, is the book, Song of Songs is such an excellent book regarding the marriage relationship um, between a man and a woman that I, I would suggest if, if you're, uh, that read the book once a year. It is that good and uh, a teacher as it regards uh, what is it that I'm trying to cultivate in, in marriage? And if you're thinking about marriage, don't just like skip it because you're like, well, I'm not married, it doesn't apply. No, read the, read the book. Um, uh, read all of God's word that it might equip us for living life uh, and helping each other along the way. Now, in terms of authorship, in the last hundred years, 
always in the last hundred years or 150 years, people try to change who wrote this and who wrote that in the Bible. And it kind of, in my view, it kind of undermines kind of the authority of the scriptures. But for 2,000 years, it was understood without a question of a doubt that the, the Song of Songs is the authorship of Solomon. And so I'm not going to take into account the last hundred years where people are like, well, I'm not really sure. No, I'm in the camp of, I'll go with the last 2,000 years of history of people had no question believing that it says it's Bob Solomon. Uh, it's got the language that, the, and wisdom language that, that connects with Solomon's other work of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. Uh, it's, it's a writing of Solomon as directed by the Holy Spirit. Um, our text also, just as a setup, it comprises a back and forth between a man and a woman who we learn uh, somewhere along the line are married. Uh, and then there is another group of uh, people called friends. And so there's this dialogue that happens along the way between the man and the woman. And the man we learn is King Solomon. Now it's a bit odd because, you know, when we look at this passage, um, it's a unique relationship because Solomon had a whole bunch of wives. <laughs> and so here we are, we're talking about this love relationship. And then we learn along in the text that he's not always there, which was actually the, the truth because he had other wives. And so there's a certain awkwardness about that. But what we do learn is that this particular lady um, who is dark skinned, who's black, um, she is Solomon's favorite. That's, that's, uh, that's made clear in the passage. Uh, another thing when we think about interpretation is she, so a lot of people are like, oh, she's this, she's this poor girl that Solomon happens upon who just happens to be super good looking. Um, well, she is super good looking from the description in the passage, but she's not some random poor girl. We learn from the text that she is, she's got jewels uh, of neck, around her neck in, in terms of a necklace. She is a landowner. She owns a vineyard that uh, returns 1,200 shekels a year, which is a lot of money in those days. Uh, and so she's not just some random poor girl who looks really good. She's, she is, uh, and it says in the text that she is the daughter of a prince. Uh, and so this is all backdrop to um, the, the story of, of that goes that is part of this. Um, another thing when we think about interpretation of the Song of Songs is that over the centuries, because of people's discomfort talking about the marriage relationship, um, they spiritualized it to just being a picture of Christ in the church. So I read this um, book from, I read about a quarter of it, by Bernard of Clairvaux. He was a monk around the year 1000. You can actually look, it, look up his writings online. Um, and he does a wonderful job of talking about uh, our relationship with Christ and his, uh, Christ's um, uh, affection for us and our affection for him. But it's all based on Song of Songs. And you're kind of like, actually, when I read Song of Songs, I don't, <laughs> that's not my first point of contact. <laughs> um, but so, so the error, the, the small error in the past is just to make it all about Jesus and the church. But another error is just to make it all about marriage. Uh, because it's more complicated than that. It actually does have some points of contact to thinking about the, the relationship of Christ and the church in the purest of senses when it comes to love. And so there's two pendulum swings we have to avoid, the, the complete spiritualization of it and then the complete uh, making it just about a, 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 the, the men, a man and a woman in their relationship with each other. So that is uh, an introduction to the Song of Songs. So I'm going to read the first four chapters, and then I've got five uh, short points that I want to just draw your attention to along the way. The other thing that you'll note is this book is amazing in terms of the employment of our senses. Song, Sol, uh, Solomon and the woman, the man and the woman, they, they often will talk about trees and fruit and spices and perfumes and crops uh, and smell and sight and touch and sound. It's an, it's an amazing piece of, just in its own right, of literature and of making contact with the whole of the, of the human person. So let's, have a, let's look at it together. And it begins with her. Uh, it's the inscription at the top, Solomon's Song of Songs, and it begins with, with her voice. 
Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. Take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. And then the friends, they chime in. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. She responds, how right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Don't stare at me because I'm dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were, and then there's a little bit of family conflict. My mother's sons were angry with me and they made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard I had to neglect. And we learn later on that she actually makes 1,200 shekels of silver per year from her other vineyard. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? And then her friends, the friends respond, if you do not know most beautiful women of women where he is, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. And then he uh, jumps in, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. She responds to him, while the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My beloved to me is a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of Engedi. He responds, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful, your eyes are doves. She. How handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming. And our bed is verdant. He, the beams of our house are cedars, our rafters are firs. She responds, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. He, like a lily among thorns, is my darling among the young women. And then she says, like an apple among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall and let his banner over me be love. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me. And then this th beginning of the threefold charge that's repeated in the passage, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Listen, my beloved, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. He responds, my dove in the clefts of the rock in the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face. Let me hear your voice for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. She responds, my beloved is mine and I am his. He browses amongst the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. Turn my beloved and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged, mount, on the rugged hills. All night long on my bed, I looked for the one that my heart loves. I looked for him, but I didn't find him. I said to myself, I will get up now and I will go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. And so I looked for him, but I didn't find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. And I said to them, have you seen the one that my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found the one that my heart loves. I held him and I would not let go of him until I had brought him to my mother's house, to the room of the one who had conceived me. And then the second time of this charge, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. She continues, who is this coming up from the wilderness like a column of smoke perfumed with myrrh and incense made from all the spices of the merchant? Look, it is Solomon's carriage, 
escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. King Solomon made for himself the carriage. He made it of wood from Lebanon. Its posts he made of silver, its base of gold, its seat was upholstered with purple, its interior inlaid with love. Daughters of Jerusalem, come out and look, you daughters of Zion. Look on King Solomon wearing a crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. He responds, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair like a flock of goats descending down the hills of Gilead. Your teeth like a flock of sheep just shorn. I don't know if I'd recommend that language today, <laughs> but it's romantic. <laughs> uh, your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn coming up from the washing. Each has its twin, not one of them is alone. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the haz of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David built with courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Your breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse amongst the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. You are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Descend from the crest of Amana, from the top of Sinir, the summit of Hermon, from the lion's dens and the mountain haunts of leopards. He continues, you have stolen my heart, my sister, my bride. You have stolen my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your perfume more than any spice. Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb, my bride. Milk and honey are under your tongue. Have you ever said that in the morning, the person that's woken up beside you? <laughs> Where were we? Um, yeah, milk and honey are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. You are a garden locked up, my sister, my bride. You are a spring enclosed, a sealed fountain. Your plants are an orchard of pomegranates with choice fruits with henna and nard, nard and saffron, calumus and cinnamon, with every kind of incense tree, with myrrh and aloes and all the finest spices. You are a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. She responds, awake north wind and come, south wind, blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread everywhere. Let my beloved come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. He responds, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten with my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk and then the friends and the first half. Eat friends and drink, drink your fill of love. That's the first half of Song of Solomon, um, an obvious passage about marriage and sex and love and desire, uh, filled with all sorts of beautiful imagery. Um, in terms of a little bit more about the passage, see at the top of the orange, um, this is the extent of the empire of Solomon during the golden age of Israel. Um, after he took the kingdom, expanded, they made all sorts of alliances uh, that didn't work out well in the end, but they have all sorts of alliances with some of the surrounding nations. And right at the top of the orange would be the city of Tyre and Sinir. And Sinir is actually referenced in the passage when he says, come down from Sinir. And so there it gives us, and the geography, so when we think about the whole question of authorship, um, the re there's references to all sorts of places spanning, really, the empire that belonged to Solomon whether it's Lebanon, way down near Jerusalem, or all the way up to the north, northern territory. Uh, and so we see, and, and then we see the imagery of vineyards and apple trees, and, 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 we, and then we saw the dispelling of the notion that she was a poor girl, because it talks about these jewels, and, and then obviously there's, uh, and then as the text continues, it continues with that. But there's a few lessons from the text that we want to pay attention to. And, and go ahead, Rob. Um, you know, we asked this question, how does this book connect to the, does it connect with the rest of the scriptures? And it does. 
Uh, the, one of the things that's obvious is it's talking about marriage and sex and love uh, inside of marriage. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians 7, he writes extensively about marriage. Um, and one of the things that's noted is that it talks about regular sexual relations between a husband and wife. And then there's this important thing, as able, within reason, and not by pressuring or guilting the other person. I think one of the things of maturity when we're married is we realize uh, how important the relationship is. But what, would, what do we see when we read the, the text here is we, we see how it fuses with the rest of scripture, but then we, and we see the application of it. Mar uh, sex and marriage is a gift from God, God's creation. Uh, and we see it beautifully and, and subtly uh, without going over the top in this beautiful book, the Song of Solomon. And we see its tasteful uh, presentation to us and we're reminded of God's great gift. Uh, and, and yet we, see, we also see how it connects uh, as a whole to the rest of the scriptures. And so when we think about, one of the things that's, when we, when we first step back from reading the book, one, we, we see, uh, we, well, we're going to talk about the affection they had uh, and, and how complimentary they were towards one another in the next point. But here we see that this is a part um, and an important part of marriage. And actually, uh, in a married couple's life, just as a sidebar, if that's an area that's starting to uh, fail, it's a time to go check in with a third party and say, we need to talk about our relationship because the, the, that sexuality within marriage is part of marriage. And so that's something that, that is, becomes a point of conversation between the married couple. The second question, and this one, this question popped into my mind, and I found it a very uncomfortable question. I didn't like the question um, uh, because it made me think. It made me think about um, how I treat my wife. Um, and, but, that's the, but that's the point of God's word, isn't it? You're supposed to read God's word and make you think about how you're living your life in relationship to others. And the uncomfortable question is, is as a married person, um, by your words and your deeds, how do you make your husband or wife feel about themselves? That's, that's a big question that comes out of the text because you and I are reading this back and forth. And is she like dogging him about, you know, you were late to dinner and you were this and you were that and you don't look like you looked when we first met and, you know, all of this stuff. Is that, does that happen in the text? No, he's like, you know, describing her as like a mare from, <laughs> from the Pharaoh's courts, right? And like a thousand shields and all this. But in the middle of all the beautiful things, they're saying some really nice things about each other. They spend a lot of time complimenting each other uh, and building each other up. Uh, and so when I stepped back and I looked at this pa the passage as a whole and I thought, oh, self, how do you make your wife feel about herself? Uh, and then wife, how do you make your husband feel about himself? Uh, and then, then, I, then I realized, if when you realize, oh, I'm maybe not hitting the mark of making them feel so good about themselves all the time, you also realize you can't fix that in 10 minutes after the service. <laughs> right? Like that's not fixed very fast, right? But it, it is fixable. Um, so if you go home in the car, or walk home, and then all of a sudden you're like, I better say some really nice things to my spouse on the way home today, <laughs> they're going to out you right away. <laughs> right? So a little strategy is, put in the back of your head, I'm going to start being complimentary and I'm going to start valuing them, lifting them up. And, and if I make a mistake, I'm going to apologize and say, I want you to feel like this woman or this man feels like in this passage. That's, that's, that's a powerful thing, isn't it? That'll strengthen a marriage, a relationship. And the question is, it's all sprung from this question. How, by our words and our deeds, how do we make the other person feel? Um, but you could extend that question to any relationship. By my words and my deeds, how do I make another person feel? Because it's got broader application. Uh, the third thing that we see in the passage is, is there is, we saw it twice already, we see this very serious exhortation. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. And the, the, the crossover into the book of Ecclesiastes, last week we, we dropped down briefly on Ecclesiastes 3 where 
you know, there's this whole passage about there's a time for everything, and it lists like 25 different things. There's a time for this and this and this and this, and our problem is is figuring out the time and, and accepting God's leading and will in our life. Uh, and, and yet here there is an idea that, you know, there is a time uh, for when a person's heart will start to think of such things. Uh, but don't you water that seed uh, uh, prematurely. You know, we live in a culture that sexualizes everything. Uh, and God says, sex is for marriage. It's God's gift. It's meant to be enjoyed within the bonds of marriage. But our culture is just like, you can have it all anytime you want. And God says, that's not how I designed it to be. Um, and so we think about our, our children, we think about uh, our friends, and let's not be part of the problem that is our culture. Uh, let, let, us, let us lead people to what is right by our example, by our words. Um, by, uh, and and, and it's, this charge is really, really important. Don't, don't awaken it. Don't water it. Be, let's do what is right and what is holy. And, and marriage is sacred. Sex is sacred. It is a gift from God. Uh, the fourth thing that we see in the passage is there is... Um, the question, there's this third party. So there's this back and forth between the man and the woman, and we see their love for each other, their desire for one another, how they talk about each other. And then there's this third group, the group that are the friends. And there is one point in the passage, and we'll see it next week. The friends kind of mess up uh, a little bit in the later chapters, because in chapter 6, verse 13, they say these really weird words. They say, come back, come back, O Shulamite, that we might gaze upon you you and Solomon then rebukes them like why are you staring at her right um, but for the most part the friends throughout uh, the book Song of Psalms are really supportive of the relationship and are there they say the right things and they're encouraging the right things with between this married couple and when I think about my role and as it regards other people's relationships and you think about how you relate when someone, you know, whether they're in a relationship, they're married or they're dating, courting, engaged to be married. Um, there's a few times in our lives where you're like, something is really wrong and I need to talk to Sally or I need to talk to Bob and, and say, hey, did you know this about that person? Uh, because we really care about them and we don't want them to get hurt. But I would be really careful how, much, <laughs> how many times you and I get involved in someone else's relationship. Um, it, if, if we feel really strongly about that, we need to pray and like, Lord, help me in this conversation because there's a risk, yes, no, <laughs> right? So the role of the friends throughout the passage kind of teaches us, you know, when I see um, a married couple, I want to encourage them to be strong in their marriage, that it would be healthy and growing and stable. Um, I don't want to be, I don't want to get involved in uh, destabilizing anybody's marriage or relationship because the Bible says we are to encourage and strengthen and celebrate uh, the marriages between a man and a woman that are there. Uh, you know what I'm saying when I talk about be careful, you know, if you put your hand in a bee's nest, you're going to get stung. <laughs> um, and so be very careful. Now, sometime in your life, you may be like, you know what? That person, I know stuff about that person, and if they marry them, they're going to be in for a world of hurt, and you're going to be like, I'm going to tell them even if it costs me my relationship, because I, that's how much I care about them. There may be a moment in your life when that happens. Uh, but for the most part, you and I are going to come alongside, and we're going to encourage and support and strengthen and celebrate. And then the last thing is, there's glimpses of Jesus in the Song of Solomon. Um, you know, I, I love this verse. And uh, we, I already mentioned its connection to the song Rooftops. My beloved is mine and I am his. You know, one of the things I realized, particularly as I've gotten older, I've moved past the teenage stage when I just see all the charged language. <laughs> and now I'm in the middle life stage when I can say, you know, I, I see that language, but I also see another beauty that's there that's making me think about Ultimately, how does this connect with the greater message of redemption and the love of God and the relationship of the church and Jesus and me fitting into the middle of it all? And when I see this language 26 times, she says of him, my beloved, over and over and over again. I'll read a few of the references just as a reminder. Um, my beloved to me, uh, well, is a sachet of myrrh. 
um, a cluster of henna blossoms. How handsome you are, my beloved. Uh, like an apple tree amongst the trees of the forest is my beloved amongst the young men. Listen, my beloved. Look, here he comes. My beloved, my beloved, my beloved, my beloved. This is how she addresses him over and over again. And this language of my beloved is mine and I am his, yes, it's speaking primarily and first and foremost about the relationship that exists between them. But then I think in a bigger picture, I think about how we as the church belong to Jesus and he is ours. Uh, we belong to Jesus, he belongs to us. That points us to something greater and bigger than just the marriage relationship. It points us to the beauty of the relationship that exists between Jesus and his church, between us and Christ. Uh, and it, it truly is a beautiful thing to think of brought into right relationship with the Lord because of the love of Christ who went to the cross while we were yet sinners and died for us. The ultimate expression of love in its purest way and, and shape and form. And then, yes, in this relationship, she belongs to him and he belongs to her. But in the bigger relationship, I belong to Jesus and he belongs to me. And that's the fusion of bringing all of the scriptures together and seeing that things, things can have two different levels to them. And that's the beauty of us studying God's word. And I hope that you have a real passion for studying God's word and saying, Lord, uh, help me today as I read your word. Help me to understand it so I can apply it in the immediate, but also... Give me insight into it so I can see how it connects to the bigger story that's being told about the love of Christ and, and the sacrifice of Christ uh, so that I can live a holy life for you. Now, there's a song, and I'm going to ask you to stand. We've got five minutes. This is like the first time I've ever finished early. Um, <laughs> and so, Ferris Lord Jesus is a remarkable fusion of language from Song of Solomon connecting it to the cross. Ferris Lord Jesus. Um, a, you know, a, a great, um, it's more than 10,000. Like the language is actually borrowed from Song of Solomon. So let's sing with us and see uh, how it, this song is fused together, but sing it as a worship song to the Lord. Fairest Lord Jesus. Yeah. 